So over the past few weeks, as I've spoken to people in the neighborhood, it really struck me that a lot of them don't know a lot about the history of the development that's at King and Queen and at Mark Street. So I thought I'd give you sort of a Francoeur Towers 101 just to run you through what's been happening. And then I'm going to be talking about some of the studies and some of the work that's been done to do the urban planning for the area. So let's dive right in. So here are the two developments. The one is at um, Queen and King and the other is at 200 Market Street. It's the one that's at King Street that the is, is being seen by planning right now, is being considered by planning right now, but it's Francoeur's intent to develop on both sites. So let's take a look at the development. So originally, this was back in November of uh, 2018, Francoeur proposed this for the development at King and Queen, and it was a six-story apartment with a 10-story hotel. And then on the, this is another view of it here, with the 10-story hotel in the foreground there, and then the, the, uh, the six-story apartment tucked in behind. On the Market Street site, they proposed a 15-story single tower with a three-story sort of podium around the, the bottom all the way around the block. Um, so this is what um, looked, it looked like the two models, one at, on King and Queen and the other on Market Street. And back then, uh, I asked and other folks asked, I know people from the Strathcona Strathcone Community Council, asked Rancor for a meeting to discuss these proposals because, you know, we didn't know much about them and we wanted to have some input. And we were told again and again that we would have a public meeting and there was no public meeting held. There never was a public meeting held for these two properties. And that's a, a spec story from uh, November of, of 2018 about this, right? Then shovels went in the ground, and I'm sure we all heard them in, at 6.30 in the morning and saw them day after day sort of actually creating this, and the foundation is now being poured. And that foundation, it goes down at least two stories, and those two stories are going to be for parking. So it, it's important to keep in mind that they've now poured and sort of literally set in stone all the parking that they're going to have for this development. And that becomes important as I, I'll talk about parking later on in the presentation. So that was a couple of years ago or a year and a half ago. So now, three weeks ago, what happened? These two developments that were put forward and got approval from the, the city for, and they've put shoveled in the ground for the one at King and Queen, are now off the table. That there was a meeting that Vrancor had with the uh, Strathcona Community Council uh, about three weeks ago where they said, you know, those, those plans are gone. We're not doing that anymore. They were sort of up in flames. And instead, they put forward two other proposals. This is the proposal they put forward at King and Queen. So the original proposal is here on the, the left, and on the right is what they're proposing now. And it's a little confusing because the, what looks like a little hotel over there on the right is actually the same one that's on the left. Um, and it's dwarfed by the 25-story apartment that they're proposing. This is for the King and Queen development. And this 354 King Street West is the one that's in front of planning right now. Um, then at 200 Market, which is right beside it, um, they're now proposing uh, four stories or four towers, possibly 25 stories height. Um, for the multiple dwelling and still the three sort of three-story podium around so it's a big development in fact it's bigger in some ways than the development and king and queen and again i'll come back to that later on in the presentation so this is uh, a model of what it will look like if rancor goes ahead with both plants now the wind study model that's the one up in the upper left that comes from a wind study that rancor actually commissioned so it's it's the best look we have at what possibly could be coming if Rancor develops both the site at King and Queen and the one at Market. The larger picture here, on the right you see a city model and that's actually on the fifth floor of City Hall. You can go and take a look at it yourself. And I've drawn in what the uh, the towers will look like. There's actually going to be two more towers in behind there, um, but this is from looking through our neighborhood out at this. And you can see that it creates just sort of a wall uh, and those little squares and rectangles at the bottom there are actually our houses, right? And this is the plan that Vrancor uh, uh, intended all along. We know that because at the meeting three weeks ago, when uh, a representative of GSP group, which is the planning group that Vrancor has hired, came and, and talked about these plans, the woman there said, yes, this is what they intended to build all along. So they have basically done a really, really nasty bait and switch, 
right? So they've uh, promised one thing and, and now are building something else. And it's the kind of thing you would expect from a really crappy appliance store um, where you're, you're offered one thing to get you in the door and then you're sold something else later on. And it's, it's interesting that, you know, this analogy works really well because a friend of mine said that the Vancouver developments actually look like somebody dropped a bunch of appliances into the city. Um, and in some ways that would be great because then if somebody left the door was open, at least they'd be casting light instead of shadow. But really what Vrancourt has done with this bait and switch has, has broken trust with the community, that they've clearly indicated they don't care what we think, they don't care about our opinion, they don't value our opinion, they don't value keeping their word with us. So it's really important to keep in mind the history of this, that they have broken trust with the community. Um, and that really shows to me that Vrancourt's word is worth squat, right? And, you know, if the game were fair, if it were uh, a world where what mattered to the citizens, what mattered to the community, uh, w mattered as much as what happened to the developer, then we could basically sort of Pelosi this, this deal. That we, because we could say, look, you promised to build one thing. Now you're building something else. Just stop until we have an opportunity to discuss this because that stoppage, that work stoppage, which would happen if, if one of us was doing something in our neighborhood and, or in our backyard and we suddenly changed the plans, that work stoppage is the only economic leverage we have, and we do not have that. So we, you know, unfortunately, we have to move forward in a world where the game isn't fair. And this isn't the only bait and switch that Vrancor has done. Um, there, recently I learned that the development that they're building on Main and Walnut um, downtown was supposed to originally have been a mixed-use residential and commercial development, and then there was a notice of a public hearing for a minor, and I'm putting minor in, in air quotes here, um, variance that was just changing the height by one uh, floor, but hidden in there, or pretty obvious when you look at it, but surprise to a lot of residents, was that they actually want to build a hotel now. So they're switching, they're bait and switching. They said, we're building a mixed-use residential, and now suddenly they're building a hotel tower. And that's caused a lot of concern in the neighborhood, and here's some of the uh, reactions to it. And I want to look at these because it's really important that say Vrancor is pulling this stunt all over town. There's some backroom BS. It's in a less corrupt, desperate city. They wouldn't be allowed to continue. So this reaction of breaking uh, people thinking that the city has broken trust with them is really an important reaction because it speaks to what I think is the real issue here for us when a uh, developer um, may get away with something like this kind of bait and switch. And again, I'm going to come back to this. And by the way, this is the development that also Vancor broke trust in terms of actually um, going ahead and building without a permit. And it really it strikes me that there's a fundamental unfairness here, that we're seeing this, we're seeing the development, the Brad Lamb development um, in uh, Television City, where the citizens are in a position where they are sort of playing developer whack-a-mole, that they keep popping these developings up and in communities, just, you know, upsetting people, upsetting the, the urban planning, and citizens have to really sort of go at them, and it keeps happening again and again. And, you know, it's, it's a really unfortunate game that we're, we're playing here, where the developers seem to have the upper hand and that the playing field is not level at all. But I want to go back to the appliances, because when I first heard about these new plans that were being developed by Vrancor, I thought, I, I really have to figure out the scale of these things. I don't really have a grasp of this. And I'm not an architect, and I'm not an urban planner, but I have a kitchen. And so I thought, well, maybe if my refrigerator was a 25-story building, then what would my one-story house on Ray Street look like? Well, it would look like a cracker. So cracker for scale down there at the bottom. It's a one-story house. It's set from the backyard, and I tried to scale this properly so it was fair. That's the kind of scale we're talking about, and it's really uh, an, you know, an, a breathtaking 
you know, scale difference that just didn't make any sense to me. So I thought, okay, maybe I've got this wrong. So I've got some sugar cubes in the house. So I made a little model of Ray from Market to Napier and sugar cubes. And there's one and two story houses. Each sugar cube represents a story. And when I did that on my kitchen counter, and that sugar box there is 13 sugar cubes high, and then the winter salt box adds the extra floors, I ended up with this. I thought, this is insane that they're actually wanting to build this, but the scale is right. And, you know, it's really, really unfortunate. So once I, you know, stopped being upset, you know, I, my brain sort of exploded because it just didn't make any sense. I couldn't understand how this could possibly make sense for the Strathcona neighborhood. And I realized talking to other people that I wasn't the only one, that people's brains were exploding all over our community trying to understand how this could possibly happen in our neighborhood because it doesn't make any freaking sense. So once I had some contemplative time in the bathroom, I thought, you know, I really need a plan or at least I need to look at some plans. But what plan should I be looking at? And because there's all sorts of plans. And these plans were carefully developed over years. And there's the Strathcona Secondary Plan, the Transitory Development Guidelines, the Cultural Heritage Resources, the Tall Buildings Guidelines, all sorts of plans that have been done in collaboration with citizens to figure out what neighborhoods like Strathcona and specifically Strathcona could look like. And it's really important to keep in mind that these plans took years and tons of citizen engagement, tons of really thoughtful um, urban planning from the planning department and really thoughtful urbanists in the planning department and consultation with counselors who care about this kind of stuff and a lot of colored dots as well. So when I started talking to some experts about this, I was directed to say, look, Wayne, you know, pay attention to these three particular plans, the Transit Orient Corridor Plan, the Strathcona Secondary Plan, and the Tall Building Guidelines, because they can really help frame uh, what's wrong with this development and, and sort of put it in the context that planners and politicians need when they move forward to make a decision about this is these plans are really important. So let's take a look at the Strathcona secondary plan. This is a map of um, the area and how it's divided up in terms of land use and residential designations and, and stuff. And again, this is a plan that has had tons of input from the community, from politicians, from planners since 2005. This looked at open space, infrastructure, institutional, urban design, transportation, residents, all sorts of stuff that people have spent tons of time carefully developing this secondary plan for Strathcona. And in that plan, the two areas of interest, uh, that one, the lower one there, the mixed use medium density is the, uh, the the uh, king and queen development that's the one under consideration right now and then high density residential in behind it that plan has a very clear vision of what the Strathcona neighborhood is about. And some of the key words here are it's historical, it's vibrant, it's green, it's livable, it's urban, it's connected. And you can read this in the secondary plan in much more detail, but it really paints a really accurate, I think, picture of the character and characterization of the neighborhood. And I recently saw a letter that one of our neighbors wrote to Andrea Deer, the planner who's looking at this, and she writes about Strathcona beautifully Beautifully. And I just highlighted a word here that these few streets are colorful, full of variety and interest, and so are the people who live here. And those people are us. Now, when you compare that with what's being planned by Vrancor, it's really hard to fit the words historical, vibrant, green, livable, urban, and connected into the models that Vrancor is suggesting because they just they don't work at all they're completely out of scale they create a wall between us and the other neighborhoods and in some ways just block our view of the the city so here's some other uh, terms and phrases that are used in the plan we're supposed to protect heritage character, foster healthy balance, encourage development to reflect historic character and cultural heritage of the neighborhood. And if you look at, and this is a model that I built up in the upper right there, the scale and the shadow and the blockage of those developments relative to the heritage character and the healthy balance of the neighborhood, it really just sort of highlights how ridiculous this really is. And I just want to point out, because um, it's, it's, I found it sort of, 
uh, sad that in this drawing, just to show, this is from Vrancor's uh, plans, uh, studies that they put forward. You can see down at the bottom there, there's an existing dwelling. That's a house that's right on the corner of Market and Queen Street, and they call it existing dwelling. And I just feel, looking at that, I just feel so sorry for that little building. And I thought that maybe in solidarity to that building, we should all get lawn signs that say existing dwelling for scale, or maybe t-shirts that say existing dweller right because it's so wacky that the, the, and also it's so out of the plan that the maximum building height that the Strathcona secondary plan calls for in the neighborhood is 10 stories and they're calling for 25 stories and that's the difference now you'll notice here that it says you can get around this if you complete required study sun shadow study visual impact study wind study and others and I'll come to those studies in in a minute but that notwithstanding there's this 25 story versus 10 story differentiation so I did a little card up of sort of a checklist that that is you know is a stress Kona secondary plan compliance checklist so does this development promote visual pleasing urban environment nope reflect and protect the heritage character no high quality urban design no less than 10 stories no match a scale of adjacent low density residence nope that's a whole lot of note from the Strathmona secondary plan so let's take a look at the transit oriented development guidelines for the city of Hamilton there's a very interesting line in there and I just wanted to highlight this here it says in reality higher transit supportive densities can be achieved while maintaining buildings of human scale and mitigating traffic impacts by increasing foot traffic. So that's a really important phrase because it speaks to the fact that it's possible to create the densities that the city is looking for, the intensity of development in the city without going to ridiculous heights. And we know that. We know that there's work being done in the city and elsewhere on laneway fill-in that you can make really great use of, of laneways to increase the density of communities without you know going more than two or three floors up. And we know from other communities in um, Europe, like Amsterdam, this is a model on the right there for some developments in Amsterdam, that are very high density, uh, maintain the historic core, maintain the look and feel of the neighborhoods and the character of the neighborhoods without going above even, you know, like six stories. So, And this is completely different from this kind of thing. And if we look at the actual transit-oriented corridor plan, um, it talks about requiring the buildings to be no higher than 22 meters. Now, when they Vrancor put forward their plans a year and a half ago, they got a, a variance so that they could actually go up to 36.6 meters high. So that variance was back in November of 2018. Nonetheless, what they want to do now is this, 77 meters high. And this is a blue whale for scale. Um, and that is a whale of a difference. Just look at the difference, even between the variance that they achieved and the new model of the or height of 77 meters. And that's what this development would look like if it was developed on the site. This is looking from the very top of Queen 75, which has now lost its view of the Scottish Rite, which is a heritage site. And if you look at the citywide corridor planning principles and design guidelines, which is a, a document that was generated back in April of 2012, there's a very simple way of sort of measuring how the podium and how the scaling and the, the increase in height should work for neighborhoods and for uh, streetways and in, interior neighborhood laneways or streets. And it's dropping sort of a 45 degree angle through the development. And if you do that, um, for the development at King and Queen, you get this. And it in no way um, allows for that kind of height because it's laughably out of scale. It's completely out of scale for the neighborhood, and it's really easy to see that in any of these kinds of visualizations. Now, I said that you could go higher than the 10 stories if you did studies, and I want to talk about those studies. And one of the things that's really important to understand about these studies, at the, these were studies that were um, commissioned by Vrancor itself. These aren't city studies. Vrancor paid companies to do 
these studies. And we don't know uh, with any of these studies if these were actually the first companies that the, that Vrancor went to for these studies or if maybe they went to other places and got results that weren't so favorable and they said, okay, well, we'll go to another company. And get. We just don't know. Um, but these are commission studies by Vrancor. And as I'm going to point out, it's kind of obvious that that's commissioning that's gone on. So here's the first one I want to look at, which is a vis visual impact assessment. And what What's interesting when you look through the visual impact assessment is that there is a big area that I'm calling the rendering dead zone and you see all these blue circles there those are places where they created renderings of the planners that were hired here the, the consultants that were hired did renderings of what the development would look like and a lot of these you can see are at a distance so the one there on the upper right um, is you know sort of an, a, a drone shot at a distance of what this looks like and this one at the the, the bottom um, left here is my favorite because it's just so far away that it's like why are you even bothering and then there's another one that's down Queen Street way way down Queen Street so it's just a little tiny square and again like who cares what it looks like at that distance what we really care about is what it looks like from our neighborhood and as far as I can tell they only did one rendering sort of pseudo rendering inside the neighborhood and this is the one they did so on the left there is a photo they took um, you know it's a terrible photograph terribly underexposed and it makes the the, the area look like you know Stalingrad in, in 1947 meanwhile their model on the right there makes their hotel look like Elsa's ice castle and if you actually combine those two images together, which they should have done themselves, and actually equalize the, the tonal values, you get this, which is a much closer representation of what that development will look like in situ with the houses that are around there. And you can see that it's a very different, you know, there's no ice castle illusion anymore, and it's blocking the sun, ironically. Um, so if we look at the shadow study that they did, the shadow studies were only done on the development at King and Queen. And, and this is important because the wind study that was done actually included the development that was at Market Street. So I thought, well, if the wind study includes the one on Market Street, we should include the shadow casting for the development on Market Street as well. And they only did, and they're only required to do, uh, shadow studies for uh, March and September, March 3rd, 21st and, and September 21st. And I thought, well, I, we should do both uh, towers or both developments and do it all year round. So that's what I did is I created a uh, model of the shadows that are all year round. And you can watch that as it runs, how it sort of sundials through the neighborhood. And it's really important with the exception of sort of later in the day as the sun's going down or in the morning when the sun's up. The um, shadows that would be cast from the single development at King and James are almost doubled because of the development of the towers, which are as high um, on the Market Street development. So all of the development or all of the recommendations or the shadows that were cast by the developments on King and James are, or King and Queen are going to be doubled most of the days by the other towers. So this creates an an incredible problem not only for the gardens along Ray Street and Market Street and Napier but you can see that the shadow also extends into Victoria Park at times and has a, a tremendously detrimental impact on the amount of sun that people a lot of people in the neighborhood are getting. I want to talk about the wind study as well. So you would think that a wind study that was done in our neighborhood, um, which we know has a, a wind problem, would actually sample wind from our neighborhood. And in fact, that's not what happened. And in fact, the way that the study was done is they built a little model of our neighborhood um, and put sensors in various places. Most of the sensors, as you can see here, those are the black dots, are within the development itself, not outside measuring, um, even in this model, what our, our wind would be. And so it's an artificial constructed um, model of our neighborhood. There was no wind sampling done within our neighborhood. And I thought it was ironic that they had to go to the trouble of building or, you know, hiring a wind tunnel to test this because really we have all the wind tunnel they need right here at, at Queen and Napier. So, you know, I got your wind tunnel right here, pal, right? They could have just dropped their model along Napier Street on any windy day and, and had a, a great wind tunnel to work with. So, what they did instead was they looked at the wind 
historically from the Hamilton International Airport. So I guess that would make sense if this makes sense. The other thing that's missing from this is in other wind study reports that I've looked at, there's a lot of, of discussion about what happens when there's wind at street level that hits a tall building or goes between tall buildings or sort of spirals around tall buildings. And there's no discussion of these kind of wind phenomena, in, especially at street level, in these wind studies. And there's no use of computational fluid dynamics. And this is a more modern way of actually modeling in software winds and buildings and the impact on building. I mean, if you're not actually going to do any wind studies in the community itself, this is another way to do it and has been quite effective and has been used by uh, consultants since about 2007. So really what we've got is a really serious, and we all know we have a real serious wind problem in uh, the neighborhood, especially along Napier and Market as you head downtown. But the conclusion of the study, which Vrancor uh, commissioned, was wind conditions on and immediately around the existing project site are expected to meet the safety criteria. Well, we know we have a wind problem now. So really, the only way that the wind study could show that it's not a problem is if somehow the towers actually fix the existing wind problem, which they won't, right? So it's you know, a really good example of uh, what happens when you commission a study like this, that you're, you're, I think they're just doing the bare minimum. They're using the historical data from the airport, and they haven't really sort of wet their finger and stuck it in the air in our neighborhood, right? So it's, I think, you know, it's really kind of a pretty half-assed exercise. So let's look at the parking study. In, I just want to compare the multiple dwelling from the old project to the proposed project. So the parking is going to be in the new project going to go up by 33 parking spots, but the number of actual units is going to go up by 236 units. So pretty significant difference between the number of new parking spots and the number of new units because they're going up to 25 feet, right? And then with the hotel, they're going, they're taking away 11 parking spots and they're increasing the units by 28. So that's a total increase of 264 units versus total parking increase of 33 units. So again, that doesn't make any freaking sense. And the Vrancor folks know this because in their own study, they say the parking requirements for the development is 381 spaces. The development is proposing 255 spaces, right? So that's a difference of 126 parking spots below requirements. So just to put that in perspective, that's four Good Shepherd parking lots. So what are they going to do about that? Well, it's an interesting problem because, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, they're already pouring the foundations for all of the parking that they're going to need for the hotel and the multi-use dwellings. So they're in a really interesting situation now because pretty soon that's going to be literally, as I said, <laughs> locked in stone. So their, their solution for this is to say, ah, you know what, Thus, if we just had located this site just a little bit on the other side, um, we would have been in a different zoning where there's 50% reduction in parking requirements. So, geez, if we had just been over here closer to downtown in the do downtown zoning, we'd be golden, right? So that's their solution to how they're going to deal with the fact that they don't have enough parking. And, I, you know, I've got a lot of questions about that. One of the questions I'm asking is why is a consultant making an argument for how to get around the parking requirements instead of just providing objective analysis? And this is a great example of what happens when the developer gets to commission the study. You get this kind of advocacy and lobbying rather than just sort of objective data. So let's put that in perspective of the Strathcona neighborhood plan. Again, here's the plan. And what they're saying is, oh, we'll just move the zoning from downtown up over here. And then, of course, when they build the Market Street development, they're going to move it over there. So they're basically trying to sort of... Uh, checkerboard into the neighborhood. They're, they're, they're drawing outside the lines. They're redefining the boundary for downtown. And, you know, drawing outside the lines really only, you can only get away with that when you're three years old. You know, that just doesn't fly. So the other question I have is we just learned about 
a mixed-use residential downtown development becoming a hotel because of a minor variance. So what would happen if they decided, we'll change our mind about this and turn it into something else? What, what happens with the parking when this development might turn into something else? So let me summarize the studies. So there's almost no renderings done from where we live. They're done at a distance or they're done at a drone's height. And, and as neighbors, we don't really care about that. We want to know what it looks like from the corner of Ray and, and Napier, say, right, or from Victoria Park. Um, and the renders that are done in the neighborhood, that one that looked, made it look like Stalingrad, um, is more PR than analysis. It's really not a fair representation. And it was very easy for them to do that properly. The shadow casting doesn't include both developments, and it doesn't show us uh, in real time or in model time what it looks like all year round. So we, so we don't get a sense of uh, what the impact will be with both of those developments, and we don't get a sense of it you know, in, in other than March and September. And there was no wind sampling done from inside the neighborhood, and that's important because it's fine to do a wind study model or if they had done it a you know, fluid dynamics model, but if it was good science, if it was a good experiment, you would actually want to sample data in the neighborhood to actually ratify that data to say, is this actually true? Are the, the tests we've got working when we actually measure in the neighborhood? Do we have some kind of test that shows us that we're within the ballpark and we just don't know that and the parking is inadequate without a zoning change and again this is important because their parking is going to be frozen soon they won't be able to add more parking so if they don't get that zoning change what's going to happen are they going to have fewer towers or fewer floors on their towers you know we just don't know what's going to happen there right so these are all questions that i think need to be raised at the vrancor meeting which is coming up um, as I record this uh, at the end of, it's going to be coming at the end of March. I'm recording this at near the end of February. So I want to also talk a little bit about the future because I talked about the parking being sort of set in stone now. So what happens, and this was raised at the, at the public meeting that w we held on February 21st. A lot of people are concerned about sort of a stop work order issue. Um, that what happens come September, now just to back up, the, this may not go to planning until November of this year or maybe January of next year, that's you know 2021. Um, so what happens come September if they're you know up to 15 stories, 16 stories, like, and they don't have a permit for building that high, so is the city gonna tell them to stop? Um, what exactly is gonna happen? We just don't know. Um, and that's really, really important to, to think about. And here, I think, is the sleeper. We know that Vrancor wants to develop four towers on the Market Street development. This is the wind study model. And as I said, it's the best look we have of this. So this is actually a bigger development in mass and I think in shadow impact than the one at King and, and Queen. So it's going to, whatever happens in terms of the impact of the one at King and Queen, is going to be in many ways doubled in terms of certainly in terms of shadow and, and I, I suspect in terms of wind um, by the new development. And by the way, this is what the new development would look like if you were at Queen 75. This is your view. Now, before I showed you a view where the people in Queen 75 lost the view of the um, Scottish Rite, now they lose the view of the escarpment completely, right? And what about the rest of the city? Uh, and this, is, this is, comes back to what I was saying earlier about this sort of whack-a-mole, developer whack-a-mole that's going on. So, you know, what's going to happen if this kind of development bait and switch happens all over the city? And one question is, if we can't trust Vrancor here, why would we trust them with our, our downtown? And we're already seeing other developers, one, uh, the McMaster development um, near Forsyth Avenue and another one at Grace Lutheran Church site, where folks along the transit-oriented corridor line are already trying to get away with taller buildings. And my real concern is that if we don't stop this here, then it's going to spread like you know a virus on a cruise ship all along the transit-oriented corridor line and eventually within the city itself. 
And I really, really think that the shadow that starts in Strathcona will fall on the whole city. And it's a shadow not only that is going to impact urban planning and the planning department and make a mockery of that planning department, but really reflects badly on the city itself and our, our city councillors itself. And, you know, that's the last thing they need. We've seen that there's been a crisis of trust and confidence in city council, much of it of their own making with the Red Hill Creek and the Sewer Gate and the white supremacist in the IT department. Um, and, you know, it's a terrible time for the city to have even more citizens distrust them. So I think that it really speaks to um, increasing the trust of the city council that if they stop this kind of development, right? So, and that's really... Un- unfortunate because you know i when i've been doing the research for this i keep hearing things like grandcore gets what grandcore wants the city won't stop a builder who builds he can do whatever he wants the fix goes in etc and go back to the uh, comments that were made about the development at um, maine and walnut you know that there's backroom deals and we're a corrupt city you know that really does damage to civic engagement it does real damage to our city politicians and i i think that that's one of the key issues here that i think that folks should pay attention to that th- that if the city allows some a developer like Vancouver who has done this bait and switch who has done stuff without building permits who has a terrible reputation in town for running roughshod over citizens then i think that really speaks uh, poorly to the trust that people are going to have in the government and the civic engagement that they're going to engage in if they do at all and we know that the city has done the right thing in the past. You know, this is the um, television city development that was put forward. And the city said, no, you can't build towers that high. Now, unfortunately, the province has said yes. And this development, as far as I know, as I record this on, on February 22nd, is going ahead. Um, but at least the city stood with the community, stood with the city, and stood with the urban planning that said this is inappropriate development. So I'm heartened a bit by that, disappointed by the fact that the province um, stepped in. So what's at issue here? Like, what is it that we're, I think we should be paying attention to and asking for? I don't think in terms of making this something that the entire city would get behind is, you know, not in my backyard, doesn't fly. It doesn't fly for me. It is in my backyard. It's literally in my backyard. But that's not the issue here. Um, It's not rural sprawl versus urban height. That's a straw man argument, I think. We know that there can be um, density without height. We know that there's other communities that have done this, and we know that we can successfully increase density uh, without increasing height to the point of making the community that, that those high buildings come into less desirable to live in. So I don't think that's an issue. I don't think it's an issue of diversity. That's been raised that, that people that are in a community don't want other people in the community or, or undesirable folks in the community. I don't see that here. I saw a tremendous outpouring of support for um, Andrew, that gentleman that was, I did a video a little while ago walking down the icy street because the sidewalks hadn't been cleared. Um, Lots of support for him, lots of support for newcomers coming to Hamilton. So I just don't see that that's our community. And I don't think our community is is adverse to change, adverse to density. It's just got to be density that makes sense for the secondary plan, for the transit-oriented corridor plan, for the tall building plan, and for the community in general. I don't think there's there, we just don't want change for the, the, you know, just because we don't, we just want everything to be the way it was right but i think what is at issue is the death of thoughtful collaborative planning that's best for the city and its citizens and the death of trust in our elected officials those are the two key things that i think that worry me about this and i think would engage um, other folks that aren't in Strathcona, aren't on Ray Street, aren't on Napier or Market to, to care about this, right? That we need to tell the city to stick to its plans because otherwise this is going to keep happening again and again and again and again. And all of the years of planning and the, the hard work and emotions went into those plans from planners and from citizens and some, some politicians are just going to be for naught, right? That I think we need to tell the council and planners that that they need to demonstrate that citizens livable neighborhoods and thoughtful urban planning and careful growth matter more than the interests of developers so um, I think that 
that's what we all want. I think that's we would all put our hands up for that. So here's what we can do in order to try to make that happen, is sign the petition that, that's available on uh, the Strathcona Dwellers um, or shadowdwellers.ca site. Inform yourself. I've put um, all of the documents that I've talked about in a Google Doc that's available from the Shadowcast, the, the Strathcona Shadow Dwellers .ca website. Tell other folks in the neighborhood and other neighborhoods about this. Send your thoughts to Andrea Deer, the, the planner who's in charge of this file. She is collecting feedback, so if you can send emails or a handwritten letter or whatever you need to do, um, that'd be great. And intend, attend the upcoming Grand Corps meeting that's on the 23rd of March. Um, the, the location may change because I think because of the reaction to the, the number of people who came out to our public meeting, I think they might be concerned about not having enough room in Erskine, which was the original place for it. And then if you're up for it, help prepare and make presentation to the planning committee that's coming up uh, maybe in the fall, maybe in early next year. Um, and I've, I've gathered email addresses and I'll be in touch with folks who expressed interest in getting more information to maybe help with that. And let's not give up. Like I think things like the uh, television city de decision by the, the province might give you a sense of desperation, a sense of like, why are we bothering? Because even if we fight this at City Hall, the province is going to step in and say, no, our density requirements mean you've got to build this kind of stuff. I, I don't want to believe that. I think that we can, as a community, fight for this and I think that we we need to fight for that so I hope that you agree and uh, I thank you very much for your attention uh, listening to this presentation and uh, I hope that we can work together to try to deal with this issue and make sure that developers like Vrancor don't get their way with our community with our city and with our urban planning thanks very much <laughs>